taking a different approach. We, uh, we are now in the third part of this series called How Do We Know? Um, the Word of God is being, again, attacked by skeptics, those who are claiming that what we believe is based on myth and fable, the invention of men, and, and uh, so let's just review a little bit of what, what we've covered so far in the last couple Sundays. When, when Jesus confronted the religious leaders, it cost him his life. When the Roman soldiers removed him from that awful cross on Golgotha, he was dead. As horrible as the fact that it is, the validity of the resurrection depends upon the fact that Jesus was actually crucified and executed. I mean, if there is no death on the cross, then there's no need for the resurrection, right? And so, in order for a person to be raised from the dead, they must first of all have died. And so without the death of cross, the message of Christ and the message of the gospel is powerless. Because all of it hinges on the, on the resurrection of Jesus, of which I will talk about next Sunday. But the Bible teaches, and we even looked at it last week, even history, doc documents of the period, those outside of the Christian uh, vein, those who are non-Christian historians, recorded the fact that Jesus was indeed crucified on a Roman cross in Judea under the orders of Pontius Pilate. In the four Gospels, each one records the cross, each one records how Jesus actually died, each one in his own way does that. In the book of Matthew, in the book of John, it says he gave up his spirit. That was the last phrase, the phrase denoting his death. In the book of Matthew, and it's interesting in the book of Luke, now Luke was a physician. So when you're reading the Gospel of Luke, it's very exact and detailed about the medical parts of things, the healings that are... Uh, denoted in the book of Luke are going into a much more detail than say the others because Luke was a, of course a physician but it says in there that he breathed his last so in the four gospel accounts Jesus death is sp spoken of very clearly he was executed because he was uh, uh, ordered by the Roman governor and uh, that the men who executed him were professional executioners and that one of the things that we discovered last week was nowhere in recorded history has anyone ever been crucified on a Roman cross and lived to tell it. Every single person who was executed on a cross by Rome died on that cross. It is capital punishment. It is the purpose for the execution. Remarkably, Matthew, Mark, and Luke each record a simultaneous event that happened at that moment of Jesus' death. From Calvary, it says that the veil of the temple was torn in two. As Jesus dies on the cross outside of Jerusalem, inside the temple, the veil that separated the holy from the holy of holies was torn. This is a very tall, multi-layered fabric, very tough to tear, and it tore from the top to the bottom. And it's very significant because when the veil was torn open, the miraculous event, event that signaled the end of the Old Testament way of sacrifice. In the Old Testament, the way that sins were forgiven was the sacrifice of an animal. And only those who were called especially by God had access to God in the Holy of Holies. But that's not all that it meant. It also means that Jesus actually died because it demonstrated the complete sacrifice that he offered on the cross had satisfi satisfied God's demands. For centuries, God had required the death of an unblemished lamb in order to atone for sin. But now Jesus is the sinless lamb of God. And because he has now died, he becomes the new sacrifice, the permanent sacrifice, the last sacrifice. And the veil was no longer needed, and access to God was not uh, available just to uh, really a single person once a year. But now God has opened up access to him by all those who call on the name of the Lord and been washed by the blood of that lamb. 
The following events at the site of the resurrection helped verify that Jesus was indeed dead. The Roman soldiers didn't break his legs. The Jews didn't want the bodies up there on such a holy Sabbath day coming as the sun was uh, dropping down in the sky. Their day began at sunset, if we'll remember. And so in the Jewish calendar, the day didn't start in the morning like it does or midnight with us. It starts at sunset. That's when the day begins. And so they didn't want these bodies on the cross during such a holy day as Passover. So they asked that the legs be broken. They went and they broke the legs of the one thief they went over and broke the legs of the other thief that would speed up the, the uh, asphyxiation that was caused on the cross. And when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. Now as a soldier whose professional experience and obligation and responsibilities to make sure that if someone's executed, they actually are dead, right? So what does that one Roman soldier do to make sure that Jesus is dead? He thrust a spear in his side, right into his heart cavity. When he pulled it out, what did he see, church? Blood and water. Medical experts tell us that is only possible in death. After the heart has stopped beating. After a person has already got no circulation in the body. The plasma inside the heart cavity that was under such great duress. So when he punctured that heart cavity and pulled it out, there was blood and water. Another proof that he was indeed dead. He's no longer alive. He's laying. So they didn't break his legs in answer to fulfillment of prophecy. Then Joseph of Arimathea asked for his body so that he and Nicodemus could bury him. Pontius Pilate... Uh, ordered a centurion to go to the cross to verify that Jesus was dead. That's in Mark chapter 15. You see, the, the Roman governor would not release the body of Christ to Joseph of Arimathea without proof from his own man that Jesus was indeed dead. And so the report came back from the Roman uh, centurion and said that it, he was indeed dead. So Pilate releases the body to Joseph and Nicodemus and him prepared the body for burial according to Jewish custom. This included wrapping the body in linen cloths with a mixture of myrrh and uh, aloes. Uh, we see that in John chapter 19. And they placed his body hurriedly before the sun set in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock. It was something that was new. It belonged to Joseph of Arimathea and it seems obvious that any sign of life would have been detected because it's unthinkable that Joseph of Arimathea would have wrapped his body in that all that 75 pounds of spices and linen strips if he was still breathing. So what do we know? We know that Jesus Christ was a real person. We know that he was crucified by the Romans. And we know that it happened in Judea. And we know that he died on the cross. And so we come to the next phase of this, how do we know for sure thing. And that is the empty tomb. According to the gospel, Sunday morning reveals a shocking truth. Jesus' friends can now come to the tomb, and the Sabbath is over, and now it's Sunday morning. They go to visit the tomb. As morning broke, uh, the women who had watched Joseph and Nicodemus bury Jesus hurriedly and place him in the tomb, now they are returning to the tomb. They're walking toward the garden, and on their way to the tomb, they're worried and talking amongst themselves, saying, who's going to roll away that stone? Because that stone was huge and big, and probably weighed at least a thousand pounds, maybe two, a ton. It's not unthinkable. And who is going to roll away that tomb uh, stone so that we can, we can apply more spices and prepare his body for long-term burial? But when they arrived, what did they see, family? Stone was already rolled away. Who was sitting on top of that stone? Uh, An angel. And what question did the angel ask those two women? Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. 
So it's overwhelming. The evidence is so overwhelming that the tomb is empty. Skeptics don't argue that the tomb was empty anymore. They, they don't because it was so much evidence in favor of it. So the, the skeptics now said, well, the tomb is empty is because Jesus' body was stolen. That's the next attack against the story, the gospel story. So let's think this through. Was it possible that Jesus' body was indeed stolen from the tomb? There's only three possible groups that could have done it, Romans, Jews, and disciples. So let's go one by one and see if any of these make sense. The Romans. Would the Romans have stolen the body of Christ? Yes or no? No. Why did, they, why did Pilate crucify him even when he knew he was innocent? Pilate said, I'm washing my hands of this man. He is innocent. But why did he command that he be crucified? Because the crowds were saying, crucify him, crucify him, and they're about ready to do a riot. Right? And so to quash this whole thing, to get rid of this whole conflict, to settle down these wild Jews and their hatred of this carpenter from Nazareth, he tried to set him free. They wouldn't have it. And so to end this thing on his watch, he doesn't want the Roman emperor getting down on him because Jerusalem isn't able to be contained. It was a terrible, terrible place to have a sense of duty. I mean, if you were going to be stationed anywhere in the Roman Empire, Jerusalem was the last spot you wanted. And so Pilate says, crucify him. Why? To get rid of this problem. So... It doesn't make sense that the Romans would later on steal his body. What about the Jews? How do we know the Jews didn't steal his corpse? Well, turn to Matthew ch chapter 27. Matthew 27, and uh, beginning at verse 62. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate. He's the governor. He was the one who commanded the execution. Verse 63, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how the deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he is risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. And Pilate said to him, you have a guard, so go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. I think this is fascinating because the Jews, remember, Jesus said, I'm going to resurrect in three days. Keep that in mind. The Jews are saying, hey, he said he's going to come back to life. If you don't put a guard over this tomb, his followers are going to come in there, steal his body and say, see, he said it. So they put a guard. Watch this in verse uh, chapter 28, <coughs> beginning in verse uh, 11. Now when they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city. Um, okay, so the context is, is that um, Jesus has resurrected and the guards are there to see it. Let's start with chapter 28, verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, the first day of the week began to dawn, uh, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like that of lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him because uh, and became like dead men. Which means, oh no. That's, the, that's another way of saying that. All right. The angel answered to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. As he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. And, and go quickly. And tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. Indeed, he is going before you in Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. In verse 9, And they went to tell his disciples, Behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! And they came and they held him by the feet, and they what? Rejoice. 
Who alone should, uh, besides God should be worshipped? Anyone? Me. No. Only God. And they worshipped him. Verse 10, Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Verse 11, Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. What did they report? We saw an earthquake. We saw the stone rolled back by an angel and the tomb is empty. That's what we saw. When they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them, his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. Well, wow, that's good guard duty right there, isn't it? Anybody stand guard duty in the service? Anybody? Anybody ever sleep on their duty watch? Go ahead and admit it if you did. No one did. Because that's not what you do. You drink coffee, right? All right, all right, all right. So anyway, it says, um, Tell them his disciples came at night, verse 13, and stole him away while he slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews to this day. And Matthew's writing this gospel 20, 25 years after the event. He said, it's still the word going around that his disciples stole his body because they bribed the guards who saw the empty tomb. You see, the Jews didn't want a fraudulent myth. They didn't want the word of Christ to come true. They didn't want it to be seen to be true. How do we know the Jews didn't steal the body of Christ? Because later on, when thousands and tens of thousands of Jews are converting to Christianity, what single thing would the Jews could have done to kill the entire movement? As all of these Jews are now converting to Christianity, they're, they're being baptized for the remission of their sins, and they're being uh, uh, filled with the Spirit of God, and they're now in the church, and they're leaving Judaism, and they're becoming Christians by the thousands and thousands and thousands. The religious leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious leaders, the priests, all they would have had to do is one thing, and it would have killed the entire movement, the entire conversion process. What was that? Produce the body of Christ. All they would have had to do is put the body of Christ on a cart and, and drive it and ride it through Jerusalem and it would have killed the movement that fast. Because the entire gospel message is based on one thing. And if that one thing isn't true, the whole thing falls apart. And the one truth is that Jesus Christ came back from the dead. So it doesn't make sense that the Jews stole the body. They wanted uh, uh, this to be obviously over with. They thought he was a false teacher and he was taking people away from the truth. They thought he was a heretic. They thought that his followers were heretics. If they wanted to stop Christianity from having such a great influence on swaying their people, they, all they would have had to do is produce the body. But you see, the Jews didn't have the body. They had to bribe guards to cover the story. So the most likely group that if anyone did steal the body of Christ would have been his own followers, his own disciples. Well, let's see how logical that is. Let's go to Luke chapter 24. Does it make sense that the disciples of Christ stole his body to uh, promote the, the myth? Beginning at verse 9. And when they returned from the tomb and told these things to the eleven, they being Mary and Mary, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna the Mary mother of the James, and the other woman with them who told them these things to the apostles. Verse 11. Can you see that in your Bible? Can you see Luke 24, 11? The apostles have just heard from the Marys. His tomb is empty. He's not there. And the apostles' reaction is, we knew it, we knew it, we knew it. We were waiting, and now it's true. Is that what they said? Are you looking at your own Bibles right now? What's it say in verse 11? They didn't believe these women. They didn't believe it. It says their words seemed like idle tales, and they did not believe them. They did not believe the testimony of these women who said they saw the empty tomb and that the angel said he is risen. 
Hmm. Well, gee, that just sounds about right for these guys, doesn't it? Verse 12, And Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down he saw the linen cloths laying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened, which is Bible language for, hmm, I wonder what this means. Hmm. He still doesn't get it. So the apostles didn't even believe the testimony that the tomb was empty, even when they saw it for themselves. Now, another reason why it doesn't make sense the apostles or the followers of Christ stole the body is because they were not looking for a resurrection. And in fact, they were already starting to abandon the movement as we move down into Luke 24, beginning at verse 13. Behold, two of them were traveling the same day to a village called Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed in reason that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, restrained so they did not know him. Which is basically the miracle was inside their eyes so they couldn't recognize him. And so... He said to them, what kind of conversation is that you guys have had with one another as you walk and are sad? Verse 18, Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and you have not known the things which have happened here in these days? Which is another way of saying, Where have you been? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our own rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we are hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, beside all this, today is the third day since all these things have happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. And they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Verse 24, And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe, and all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ have suffered these things to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. They're on their way back home. They're on their way to Emmaus. They are, it's done. He's dead. They killed him. It's over. They even know about the women's testimony. They know about Peter, at least Peter going to the tomb to see it's empty. And they're like, let's just go home. It's over. These men were not looking for a resurrection. None of these people were looking for a resurrection. The women went there to prepare the body for long-term burial. All the apostles and all the disciples, they weren't even there to wait to see the open tomb or see him walk out. None of them, because they were not looking for it, even though he specifically said he was going to do that. But if we fast forward on the clock, later on, Christianity is under severe persecution, and the leaders of Christianity are under even more persecution, and the Roman government decided that they wanted to completely get rid of this new sect that was uh, growing not only in Jerusalem, but in Judea and Samaria and all over the Roman Empire. And as they would tell people, all you have to do to stay alive, they would capture and imprison Christians, and they would say, if you will recant your confession, if you will say that Caesar is God, if you will say that Jesus Christ is not king, is not Lord, we'll let you live. And the disciples were martyred instead. They would not recant their testimony they would not say he is not lord so what convinced them so much that he was indeed god in the flesh that he was the savior and he was who he said he was what was the evidence the empty tomb during watergate as the pressure mounted and more and more information began to be revealed that there was a break-in and that the president found out about it and began a cover-up of it, John Dean decided to turn state's evidence. Why? 
Why did he stand up before the Senate hearings and say, this is what's happened? John Dean was special counsel to President Nixon. That means he was his lawyer. And the lawyer said, I need to say something. And because of John Dean's testimony, Ehrlichman, Colson, uh, Liddy, all those guys went to prison. The president resigned the day before he was going to be in, the impeachment was going to begin. And that all happened because John Dean was the one who stood up and said, I know that this is a cover up. And why did John Dean do that? Because no one wants to go to prison for a fraud. Amen? And nobody wants to die for a lie, right? Would you die for a lie? Would you invent a story, then later on they say, uh, say it didn't happen and we'll let you live, and you went ahead and died anyway? That's, that doesn't make sense. No one does that. So, I won't die for a lie, but I will live for the truth. The truth is that Jesus Christ actually existed. The truth is Jesus was killed by the Romans on a cross. The truth is, listen to me now, the tomb that they buried Jesus Christ in is still empty. Right now, wherever it may be. The tomb, is it still empty? It is. Don't you know that between A.D. 30 and 2017, if anybody had found the body of Christ, they would have produced it and everybody in the world would have known that what we're believing is a sham? Of course, if they could have found the body of Christ, everyone would know it. But you see, here's the deal. Where can you find the body of Christ right now? Well, one more passage and we're done. Let's read it together. Ready? Go ahead. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, and in order that you may know the hope of which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead, and... So if you want to see the body of Christ right now, where is it? It's seated on a throne at the right hand of God the Father. That's where the body of Christ is. Is the tomb still empty? Yes. Is Jesus alive? Where is Jesus? He's at the right hand of God. And every tongue will confess, and every knee will bow, that Jesus Christ is Lord. That same book, uh, Philippians chapter 2 says that. You see, I love the way he starts this. He says, I hope the eyes of your hearts are enlightened. I hope you, op you open up the eyes of your heart and see the truth of this. That the same power that God used to exert Jesus from the dead is the same power available to us today. That's good news, isn't it? I mean, I want some of that, don't you? I do. All right. So, next week we will talk about the actual resurrection. Is there proof that Jesus Christ was actually seen beyond the grave? If so, we'll find out next week. This is the gospel. The gospel is under attack. The Bible is under attack. Christianity is under attack. The truth is under attack. It's always been under attack. For 2,000 years it's been attacked. Right now in America, people have a Bible in any kind of fashion, form, digital, or hard print, or whatever they want. But they're not reading their Bibles. And the people who are, and the reason why is for several reasons. But one of them is because people have said you can't rely on it. What it's made up of is just myth and fable. And it's not. It's truth. And it's verifiable. And it's fact-based. Yes, we live by faith, but our faith is based on evidence. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand up and let's sing. Tim's got another song for us. And if you need prayer this morning or encouragement,